I've been stuck in a taxi because it's me, I'm a little bit late. I think I was born late. And so we begin this with my profuse apologies for my late keeping. And you say, that's okay. And you say, calm down and sit down. And, and here we are. I was actually thinking you would be late and you weren't really, I don't think. But it's good to meet you. If we were to be successful working together, what would we have accomplished? What would change for you? I would have more joy. Joy is my energy. And so if we could achieve something which was joyful, then I would find an extra, an extra spring, spring, an extra spring in my step. In the real world, I speak to another lady. And so I am willing to go all out there. Yeah. There's no filter on my part. Yeah. I, I've been part, well, my, my story is unfolding like everyone else's. And I'm still trying to answer your question. My life partner of 35 years has, has just had enough. And, and so we are, unfortunately, um, and with great sadness, uh, separating. Um, Damn. But, but she's a wonderful person. But there's, there's a, a charge sheet, which is long and extensive, about my behavior, the behavior really coming from, from my mind and my personality. And there's one word in particular has been, I think, overused on that charge sheet, which is narcissism. And I, I get it. But this makes me laugh. But maybe it shouldn't. But I believe I'm being tended to presently by the UK's leading practitioner in dealing with patients suffering from narcissism. Maybe that's a narcissistic thing. What does she mean by narcissism? Well, what do any of them mean? Well, in the real life, we don't like labels. And what I've got to so far is that I, and I'm sure like many other people, have many flavors floating around my personality. And for sure, there would be a narcissism. But that is not to say it's either the dominant or the it's exclusively that. Why I don't like it is it's a kind of go-to word. And I think it came a bit with the Tinder generation and that the exposure to that kind of rapid dating and the kind of, the kind of assy guy kind of thing. And, and so there's a lot of, like I said, there's this kind of a lot of journalists writing about, it would seem like dates and then using this word as if, and then giving it some clinical superiority, which they're not equipped to use. In my context, I think it, yeah, well, maybe that's something to explore. I don't know how I'd like, you know, hey, listen, you know, we're doing this. Is, is this narcissistic? Is the acid capitalist show narcissistic? The, yeah, again, maybe. But again, for me to stop talking, if I was, like so can i say clinically but i, I want to say professionally the the label would be an, an ambivalent attached type is where mm. we got i'm ambivalently attached um, attachment theory so profound deep desire to be loved but then when i find it it's almost like i have an infantile infrastructure and i can't quite make the best of it so how is it for you now? Like, is it okay? Is it, are you happy about it? Is it hard? Okay. You and your, I assume wife of 35 years, because you said divorce. So literally how is life right now in the midst of this thing? Yeah. Uh, well, the, so I married my first date, my only date, <laughs> call me impulsive. Right uh, after the date or? No, not right after the date. Okay. No. Well then, you know, but literally more impulsive. Literally, there's been no one else. So that's mm -hmm. the, you know, I'm sure we're going to discuss. I want to say that I, I don't know why, because it seems like I, I had profound wisdom where I was willing to sacrifice the 10 years of 10 years of being a teenager to try and get escape speed velocity to get the hell out of Dodge. I kind of rejected my surroundings um, and I'm not 100% sure where that came from. But so my life was kind of, you know, I, I didn't drink, I didn't socialize. Um, I didn't have girlfriends until I did. And I was just bowled over. I was like, wow, this is just amazing. And and I became very attached to that person. Um, to, How now, old were you? When we met, poor, okay. 18 and 17. Um, and how old are you now? Do you mind me asking? More or less. You well, know, you can work it out. I, I used the number of 35. You can add that on to 18. But, okay. You know.
But I, I very much subscribe to the Parisian ladies culture where we, if you're Parisian, you anglicize your name. So a lot of Elizabeths um, and Joans, and you never discuss your age. So I'm John. <laughs> I'm Jean Hugues Hendrix uh, on my WhatsApp, and I never discuss my age. But yeah, so so I was, you know, I knew it was coming for a year, and and I seemed, I have this powerful force within me from when I was ten and rejecting that life, and it's like that this dominant. 10 year old frustrated angry kid that's saying no no we're rejecting this we're going higher you know is still there mm. and part of the attraction the elixir you know, why do i live in saint bart's i live in saint bart's through a profound error of judgment which i was subconsciously unhappy i don't know if that was relationship prior to saint bart's yeah, I, like is I, I got the escape speed velocity and I got out of the housing project and I and I got there. But it was always like another to go to another to go to. And the force being this 10 year old kid, like uh, the voices in my head. And so I was in London and then I, I had this. I was the caricature of being a hedge fund. So if you're in Manhattan, you've got the place in the Hamptons. If you're in London, you're in the Cotswolds. You know, life repeats itself. Uh, and. You literally off a little, I'm spont- I spontaneously combust. On one of those thumbnails you get in property listings, I bought this amazing country house. And I thought that would make me happy and for a while, but it, you know, it didn't persist. Uh, and then ultimately it's like, well, the, the, the most incredible, amazing, wonderful place in the world is St. Bas. Boom, that's going to make me happy. And you know, what an idiot to associate happiness with geography. And, mm, and so, yeah. you know, you know, Buddhism and wisdom and all that stuff, it finds you, it typically finds you with trauma. And, mm-hmm. and so, I'm beginning to rewind the, the reel and, and see some of these errors. But, but the other thing for St. Bart's was it was like saying to the, the, the internal kid, it's like, look, stop pushing, right? Let me, my mantra, which I think it exposes a lot, is, I'm determined to get younger every day. I'm Benjamin mm-hmm. Button. I feel like Benjamin mm-hmm. Button. And mm-hmm. St. Barbara's does have this thing where I feel 10 years younger. And, mm-hmm. and it resets every day. So you can imagine there's a lot going on. Um, so I was profoundly devastated. Profoundly devastated. Really went down hard. When that, your wife announced that she was yeah, going to divorce that, you. That was the end of June. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know where, where time went to, but I woke up and it was September. And I, I can't explain it, Denise, but I, well, I mean, I did a lot of self-help, principally meditation. In the interim or over the years? No, I, I, I tried it in the past, uh, you know, it, it just, you know, whereas I, I, I now find myself with an incentive. I, you know, I, was, I had a problem to solve back then. I didn't have a problem to solve. What it seems to have, I'm fascinated with what's happened because I feel like I've created a, a firewall and I've contained it and it doesn't, wow. it really doesn't creep in. No. Meaning but, you've accepted it and it's like, maybe you wouldn't choose it, but you're like, well, what's the gig is, so I'm good. Yeah. Like, um, now, I may be in denial. It may be that I've just buried it quite deep but it's still there and if it's unresolved then we'll be dealing with that in future episodes okay so <laughs> but but there's been a profound release of energy and so here i am traumatized and dealing with this tragic incident in my life and people are coming up to me and saying wow you look wonderful what, wow. what's, what's i was in miami last week i mean the explain i just feel like my life force is now just really at the center i feel probably there was a repression you know like you can be you now yeah yeah i think maybe yeah but then the charge is well i'm out of control in what way and so i mean so and in what way more so but what way (laughs) well well what do you think you are i mean i guess that's all that really matters well let's take last week Okay, in, in context. So Art Basel, Miami. I was 
very keen to go there because I, I went to the freeze art thing in London and discovered that these are just, they're just such a big party. And I went to my first one, didn't look at the art, made some wonderful new friends. And, and in the party scene, again, I had this energy and people were coming to me. And this never happened in my life. And I was like, I want more of that. Literally, I never, well, I've never put myself out there. The only time I put myself out there kind of is, is when you see that kind of effervescent kind of thing that I do on Bloomberg and like you shine a camera. And, and so Miami was, was the same, was the same thing. And, and so being out of control every night was like four in the morning before I got to bed. And that's okay. Um, and indeed on the Friday, I had the first ever where I, I stayed up all night you know, on the beach watching the sun coming up. And yeah, I had made many demons to overcome because like, we don't do that. Like beyond two o'clock, it's the dead zone. There's just no upside. You know, that whole, the, 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 the thing that holds you back or regulates your behavior. Did it cause problems? I mean, you're well, in me, Miami yeah. for Art Basel. Like, I mean, I was in Miami to meet girls. But, you didn't um, have to be at like work the next morning or anything. Well, but that's the point. I'm I'm always on. And so the evenings were wonderful. Tender is the night, savage is the morning. Now that's not to speak of a hangover, it's to talk about waking up with this siren, this klaxon in my head, again going back to that kid saying, What the hell happened here? And can I tell you? We've got like 10 very pressing things to do. So there was stuff, you actual stuff like of life that you needed to do that was hard to do because you'd stayed up partying till 4 a.m. Yeah. And, and so there's always going to be a litany of things that I've got to do. And at this present juncture, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with that trauma. I'm dealing with the release of energy. I'm dealing with you know, flirting with these kind of, you know, mid 30 year old girls discovered like emojis. And and, I mean, it's just a platform where you go straight to flirting. Who knew I'm the biggest flirt ever? But I knew that. I could tell that. You didn't know that about yourself? (laughs) Like your whole life's a flirtation. Really? Well, I don't know. Like the acid capitalist is sort of like, oh, it's very flirtatious. Meaning that like, you're gregarious and you're funny and you're like self-revealing or all these things that like, which if you mean that, like that you just discovered that you're a flirt, I'm kind of stunned. Have you been sort of playing the introvert for 30 years? Well, aren't the most extroverted plagued by the introversion? Doesn't the comedian come off the stage and, and fall into a dark funk? I don't know. Yes. And so like, so you're conflicted. You went to Art Basel last week. You partied till 4 a.m. But like some part of you thinks you shouldn't have done that. It was great. And you saw like a different side of yourself. But some yeah. part of you thinks you sh- something bad about that. Yeah. So I, I still think I'm still a little bit too tight inside. The regulator's too tight. I think so. But it punished me. Like the, the days I wouldn't allow myself to leave the, the bedroom. I sat in front of my computer. My productivity was abysmal. Like, like Hugh, you have to work. Like you, you have to do three hours of work because you stayed up till four. I mean, like what was going on? Yeah, th- very much that. But also, I mean, like I do have to, I've got deliverables. Oh, okay. And, and what I, so, you know, we all have, a, I, I've always had that anxiety, that, that first thing in the morning, anxiety. You know, I, I jump out of bed to escape that anxiety. And I, and Which I, is what? I have to be productive today? I have to get this list of things done? I have to, what is it? Well, it, it goes back to the, you know, I don't want to be, it, it goes back to the notion that I got over-promoted in the hierarchy of my family when, when I was, I don't know, between eight and 10 years old, in that my parents took on a financial commitment. They took on a mortgage. And, you know, and this is going way back. This is going back for yeah. a year. And and therefore both parents were working and and there was and I was given tasks to perform, which would be housekeeping tasks. 
Uh, but I took them prof- profoundly seriously, and and I enrolled my younger brother to perform to help perform those tasks. And I was profoundly mean and nasty because he was like, you know, it was like peel the potatoes, you know, set the table mm-hmm. for dinner. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. give me a break. I'm six years old. I've been to school. I'm going to watch cartoons. And oh, I'm like, so you were a taskmaster. Taskmaster, and 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 I'm. Again, a maturity which wasn't warranted, and so it's it's that taskmaster that comes comes back to haunt me. But I have to say, like, so I've got the, the I've got the girls, I've got the the separation. I am eight weeks away from a client, my first client at, at the new villa. I'm building the second villa. It's thirteen million dollars. It's a huge construction project on a tiny island. Everything is all conducted in French, which is to say, I understand maybe fifty-one percent of it. The rest is a bluff. Um, I've mm-hmm. been prof- I'm profoundly let down by one of my suppliers, and it's it's touch and go whether I'm going to be able to deliver. I mean, I had a I had a confrontation with this guy today. I was like, you know, we're now blood brothers. But option A, I should be phoning the client. Hopefully, the client's not watching. I should be phoning the client saying, it "Ain't going to be ready. Here's your hundred thousand dollars back." But that hundred thousand dollars to me just now is it could break me. And it's like, and if I do that, I will break you, the French guy, you know. And this is all in French, you know, because contractually he is responsible for me contractually failing my duties with the other clients. So all of that's going on. And then I'm going to make a thousand interior design decisions. Yeah. So is that to say that like right now, because of a variety of circumstances, it sort of feels like your parents' mortgage? Oh, yeah, yeah. I I definitely inherited their financial anxiety. And, and I keep kind of, you know. Hmm. Recreating it. Yeah. Why? Why would I do that? It's not a source of joy. Well, we all, I mean, number one, we just default to recreating the same emotional storyline that we experienced in the first 10 years. Like, that's just the default. Because that's what your brain like sort of expects. So you unconsciously put the pieces together to just go through that storyline. There's some argument that you feel like you survived that. So you know you can survive that storyline as opposed to some other storyline. That's one argument about how it, why it happens. The other is like that you're really trying to resolve it once and for all. So like it's astonishing. It would be astonishing. I and mean, it's astonishing to me, but I'm sure it'd be astonishing for any of this audience to hear that you feel like this hundred thousand dollars at this moment would break you. It's funny because my go-to place is to amplify the drama. So again, I had a, unfortunately, I had a, an un, un, unwelcome correspondence from from my my ex-wife, and you know she's got hurt, and and she shared the hurt, um, and and from that point, and I jumped into looking at the cash flow projections and whatever of, of the the property business, and. Within an hour, given the funk she'd created with, with that, I convinced myself that my business was going insolvent. And I wrote this mm. long email to the divorce lawyers to say, that I think we've got to suspend the divorces. I don't think the, the money's there. And it was like two days later, the lawyers came back and said, we've kind of looked at it and it looks okay. And, and so you, it's kind of like I got a psychotic blindness. I just needed to think, this was truth or dare. This was the moment of where it's binary. We're going to make it or we're not going to make it. Well, I'm sure it felt like that a zillion times when you were growing up. I mean, yeah. isn't that sort of the way your parents, like it always felt once they got that house with that mortgage? Like that it was, you're always, you were there, but you were sort of on the edge the whole time? A little bit, a little bit. Um, you was- felt like you had to save them that you had to make it okay so it must have not felt secure i really don't know i can remember lots about it except i can't really i the dominant feeling that i recall is one of loneliness back then and actually for all that saint bart's is wonderful uh, when i'm when so when i so when i go to miami and i'm going to london tomorrow it's going to be extrovert and very silly, out of control, me. But in St. Bart's, 
that's kind of not that person. I'm getting younger, you know, so I'm surfing and, but I'm thinking and I'm, and I'm, I'm building, you know, the, this, this property. Wow. And I'm alone here. I'm, you know, and people, this is a fantasy island, but you, you kind of have to detach from fantasy island. You got to live in the real world. Like you have a life there and a business there. Yeah. But it kind of requires, it doesn't require, but I've kind of where presently my interpretation is, it requires of me to be kind of like sage, like in the last Jedi and being on my own. I mean, I mean, if you could see, and again, I'm for sure I'm, I must be guilty of exaggerating this, but I have been camping for the last two weeks. Camping, like C A M P I N G. I mean, not where for and why. Not, because again, I've convinced myself that I got no money because I need the drama of of I need the oh my god, yeah, I'm not going to make it. Well, if you grow up feeling like you have no money, it's really hard to get rid of that feeling, no matter how much money you have. It really is like, because, you know, your neurons and synapses did no money, like literally trillions of times in the first X number of years of your life. Like in that early experience, you know, why wiring, yeah, wiring by firing. So that's how neurons work. Like the more they are used, the more like that connection is wired. And so it's hard to offset that. So my most potent neurons are the neurons that, that yeah. Say you don't have money. Yeah. That, or that you're almost out of money. I think it's more not that you don't, that you're just almost out. But again, I, and I don't know if it's, because I, I did kind of think, oh my God, actually, I'm a risk taker. Who knew? I was in denial of that. I'm like, again, you'd be like, have you not been conscious for the last several decades? But I, again, I, I was working with a, a different narrative, being in control, being a qualified, like all, all of my risk taking was qualified that calculated. I was calculated. Yeah. And um, that was my superpower. I was willing to take risks because I felt I, I had ownership of, of it, of, of it being wrong. It was most likely to be wrong. And, you know, it would have a, a, a very large, profit opportunity if I was right because in in the in the orthodoxy of the world it was deemed to be unlikely mm-hmm. um yeah I was walking around I was thinking because I got it all on the line for this the second property but then and again what I was going to say I, I have chosen like so in French we say Je suis un gitan. I'm a I'm a gypsy I've chosen a gypsy life just now you know so I I don't regard the houses here as mine they're not mine they're commercial properties they're they're rented they're great Gatsby, but I mean, in some respects, they are mine. But who had to you... camping? Where were you living? Well, prior to camping, so I've been jumping around from London, LA, etc. Right, right. And, and then the season only really started at the end of October in terms of clients, and so and we have a down period where we close the houses and do maintenance. So I, I was able to, to occupy a room uh, in the house. Prior to that, I was living in. I mean, if, if anyone goes back a few months to the shows of the asset capitalist from the bunker, I mean, I was living in the in the the work site under the most excruciating circumstances. But like you know, today I've got all of my possessions are in thirteen. I don't know if thirteen significant, but there are thirteen plastic supermarket bags in two cases. Where did your wife live? She lives in a glorious five five-story townhouse in London. And so again, in my world, which is, which she claims is an invented reality, in my in my world, I, we are poor. And, and so I've taken the hit to live like the gypsy, albeit in, in paradise, but I'm like, I'm on my own, you know, I don't need much. I've not lived with a kitchen in a year. I, you know, I eat raw food which is to say bags of salad. And Mm -hmm. and so I've been saying, gee, you know, I took the hit. But, you know, and seriously, the property development, you know, there's a whole thing about European policymakers and they had negative interest rates and whatever. Um, They never pass it on to the real folk because in America, sorry, Europe, you have to amortize the loan. There's no refinancing. They they don't like you refinancing. Um, And so you get fixed rate at 2%, wonderful for 20 years. 
but you've got to pay 5% of the capital back. So you're paying 7% of what you've what they've lent you. Mm-hmm. And seven on a big number. It's big. You've got to be careful. So mm-hmm. I, my, my thing was I would have a very small expenditure and and given my I'm an attached type, I would that would be my my thing for the for the for the family. That as I've discovered, that was interpreted as just one of my overbearing personality uh, disorders. Because you wanted to do this crazy thing of develop property? Like what? No, the, uh, the, the notion is that my decision to have the 13 supermarket bags and to have no permanent residence. Oh. So I've lived on the island for, for eight years. Why haven't, why don't I have like my place? Well, A, because I keep doubling up the risk so that I get a bigger and bigger property, commercial property. Is living out of, is camping fun? It's tiring. You know, I mean, I, mm. I shower in the work site. The Portuguese builders are now kind of accustomed to my eccentricities. It is fun. It's been challenging. Do you know why it's been challenging of late? Because I've had no Wi-Fi. Oh. Yeah. I can live anywhere. Okay. Give me Wi-Fi and, and allow my mind to be lit up and I can, I can live anywhere. Yeah, yeah. You don't, I mean, I couldn't camp, but I can see how you could. But that would make thing. it better. What, let's go I'm back I, to the beginning. What would- am I out of control? I don't know. Are these decisions all suspicious and and deserving more attention? Who knows? Well, okay, they're unusual. They're unusual. But are they out of control? I don't know. Like, you made a bunch of money. You've been sort of trying to live life as you find interesting. That's unusual. Is it out of control? And even if it were out of control, what does that mean? Like, you have... Grown daughters, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I mean, grown. The youngest mentally is has, has is towering above all of us, um, but she's 15. I've got a daughter, okay. 19, and I've got a son, 20. Do they, where are they living? One of them's in Paris. One is with her mother. And, and, and my son is in Manchester studying PPE, philosophy, politics, and economics. And so I, no, no, speak of. I almost never buy the story I'm given. So I don't necessarily buy narcissists. And by the way, there are sort of at least two different types of narcissism, one of which the general world doesn't know very well or out of control. It's usually never what people say it is. So that's why I said, what's the, what's their definition of narcissism? Is it that you only ever do what you want and never consider anyone around you? But, you know, that's- but I think that was subject to a misunderstanding. So we came to St. Bart's as a family. It had a profound impact on me where it made me feel younger. It, it definitely did. Younger, not necessarily happier. We stayed for 18 months. It was imperative with regard to education that the kids had to return to, let's call it normality. Mm-hmm. I found myself unable to return. I was the father that didn't go back. Uh, and that, that's been running for five years. So that, that's a strain. Mm. And that was something that the kids had to deal with. Did they really want you to come back? I think, I think so. So I, they were very sad that you were going to stay. It made our, we never kind of discussed it. It made our family kind of different. It was like, I mean, my kids were just like, that's crazy kind of thing. And so it kind of did fall into something of that. But I, to that rap sheet of the, you know, doing things exclusively. So there's, so there's an example there, there you go. I chose me, but then we'd have daily calls. And I guess my wife wanted to, wanted me to say, Hey, darling, you know, how are you? My God, must be so hard. You've got the kids and all the school stuff and, and everything else. And, and I didn't go there. I, instead, I would say, can I just tell you the, the 10 most tasking things that I had to do today? Why did I choose to do that? Was that being caught up in myself? Maybe. Or was it that I felt ashamed in not being the dad that didn't go back? with the family and therefore I felt this overbearing impulse to justify the day that I had that it wasn't a day in paradise it was a day where I was working for the family 
Do you know what I mean? So well, that that's, seems plausible. That's my interpretation of it, but it can cut both ways. Hi, this is a fake voice generated with AI. Those of you who are not patrons, your ride is over. To see the rest of this video, join the tribe and subscribe at patreon.com slash uhendry. Patrons, brace yourself and please keep your hands and feet in the vehicle at all times. Thank you and now back to our normal programming.